on? Am I good? Sounds that way, right? Well, good morning again, church. Again, we want to welcome our uh, church family in Greece. Glad you guys are joining us this morning. And uh, those online, we're glad that you're here. I had the privilege of bringing the word of God as we continue our series in 1 Corinthians. We're in chapter 12 this morning of the series Messy Church. And uh, the title today is A Healthy, Functional Body of Christ. Now, real quick, before I even knew Mandy, this is way back in the day, I was living in Virginia at the time, and uh, I had a couple buddies I spent a lot of time with. We had, there was a guy that was older than me and one that was younger, and the older one, he, uh, he was engaged, but he had this really small apartment, really small apartment. We called it the bachelor pad. We spent a lot of time there. We did a lot of golfing, bowling, goofing off, just being, you know, 20-something dudes hanging out. Well, one weekend we decided that we were going to binge watch a whole bunch of movies. One was Lord of the Rings, which is super long. So we were up really late one night, and his apartment was so small that we decided to just stay there, and we had to sleep on the floor. I'm telling you, this, this apartment was tiny. It almost didn't fit me. I'm a large man. But uh, it was so small that me and my other buddy had to sleep on the living room floor. He had hardwood floors. Anybody has ever slept on a hardwood floor before? That's not pretty, is it? Well, he was like four or five feet from me. And in the morning, I, I woke up kind of early and I thought, I, I need to go take a shower. Is this, is this feeding back, Kent? Sounds like it's messing up. I, I apologize for that. Anyway, I, I got up early because I was going to go take a shower. And so I, I rolled over and I went to get off the, off the floor. And because I slept on the hardwood floor, this leg was asleep. And I'm telling you, like, it was almost like my leg was non-existent. I couldn't feel it. There was no tingling. You know how, like, when you have a, a, an extremity that falls asleep, it tingles. That did not happen here. So as I went to get up off the floor, do you know what happens when you have a tripod and you take one of the legs off? This one? I'm not kidding you. I fell forward with my elbow and landed on his face. Oh. I landed on his face. <laughs> Can you imagine being woke up that way? A 230-pound man at the time, falling elbow first on your face. He was rolling around. He's like laughing and crying. And he's like, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> and I went to get up again, and I fell on his face a second time. <laughs> so not only did I wake him up, I really woke him up. And I'm not joking when I tell you it happened a third time. <laughs> I fell on his poor face three times. And I finally had to be like, dude, I promise I'm not trying to kill you. I can't feel my leg. I can't get up. He's, he's rolling around on the floor like I'm sure he thought I was trying to take him out, but I was not. And uh, eventually I was able to get up and go to the, go, go take a shower, but my leg was so asleep. Like I, I still remember when it started getting feeling and the tingling and stuff, like it was, it was awful. It was so bad. And I'm hoping that we're still friends and that he's forgiven me for falling on his face. But there was dysfunction in my body that day. And, and it was hard to function properly for a little while. My, my body had to compensate for the parts that weren't functioning in it. And, and it actually caused harm. I mean, I can laugh now, but harm is not a good thing. Um, that dysfunction caused harm to my buddy. Have you ever experienced something like this? Have you ever, you know, experienced dysfunction in your body and it became difficult or impossible to carry out your work or your tasks and it had a negative impact on you and or those around you? Has that ever happened to you? Or am I the only one that's fallen on somebody's face? <laughs> no, we've, we've all experienced some of that, right? Well, the, the same kind of dysfunction can happen in the body of Christ, in the church, this is what was happening in the Corinthian church, and this is why Paul is addressing it. This is what we're going to be looking at today. So just like the human body, where there's a lot of diversity in parts, uh, in, in the parts of the body, there's also a lot of diversity in the church body. So the question this morning is, how can we be a healthy, functional body of Christ? Well, Paul is going to give us those answers here. In verses 12 through 14, there's a, there's a couple things we need to understand. The first one is in verses 12 through 14. We need to understand that we are a part of the body. Understand that if you are a follower of Christ, you are a part of the body. This is what Paul says in, in verses 12 through 14. He says, just as a body, though one has many parts, but all its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit so as to form one body. 
whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free, and we are all given one spirit to drink. Even so, the body is not made up of one part, but many. So what makes each of us part of the body? What makes that even possible? As a follower of Jesus, at the moment of your salvation, you become part of the body of believers. You become part of the body of Christ. And this is what I think Paul is saying here in verse 13 when he says, baptized by one spirit. These things, everything kind of bottlenecks at, at the spirit, right? And that's what I hope we're going we're gonna to hear here through this point. Um, there's two things that happen when we're baptized by the spirit. Number one is we're sealed by the Holy Spirit. And number two, we are connected. We are connected to Christ and we are connected to each other. And, and here's what scripture says about that. In Ephesians, it says, um, when you believed, you were marked with a seal, the Holy Spirit. And it also says he is a deposit guaranteeing. So I know when we say the word seal, what comes to my mind is like a Ziploc bag, right? They're supposed to seal. I can never get them to seal. That's not the kind of seal that we're talking about. In the old days, when someone important was writing a letter or sending a document, what they did is they had wax and they would mark it with a specific mark so that you knew that the person sending it was the one sending it because that's their mark. That's the seal of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the mark of Jesus. Jesus promised his church, his people, the Holy Spirit who would come to help, who would come to lead and guide and, and to convict. So when you're convicted of sin, you know, you're on the cusp. You, you, you have those moments in your life when you, you feel sin is, is creeping at your door and you're convicted about it. That, that in your soul that's tearing and you're like, what do I do here? That's a mark of the Holy Spirit convicting you to not sin. And it is sealed. He is sealed in our lives. He's the mark of Jesus Christ. That's what, what happens when we're baptized by the Spirit. And uh, the, the connected part is what I believe that Paul is saying in verses 12 and 13. Um, he says, just as a body, though one has many parts, but all its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free, we're all given one spirit to drink. So do you, do you see how Paul kind of ties this together? We're all part of Christ and we're all part of the body. So the first thing we need to understand is that you are part of the body. That's what the Holy Spirit does for us. He connects us to Jesus and to each other. There's a great significance and weight that we need to give these first two verses. They, they confirm that we're sealed. They confirm that, that we're connected as part of the body. And Paul is reminding the Corinthian church here uh, of this, and he's drawing them back to this root of their commonality as part of the body of Christ, because they were getting away from it. And it's not hard to figure out what Paul is getting at. I mean, did you notice how many times he, he said the word one in those few verses? I think it's five or six times he says one, one. We're one body, one spirit. Everything, again, bottlenecks at the spirit. It brings us together. And so he's reminding them of their commonality. There is one root, one source that unites us with Jesus and other believers. That's the Holy Spirit. Now, the spirit doesn't just uh, make us part of the body, but he also gives us gifts. He gives us gifts to use as part of the body um, that benefit the body as a whole. Think of your own body. If you didn't have a thumb, there's probably a lot of things you couldn't do. You young boys, you couldn't play PlayStation. You couldn't play the Switch. <laughs> right? <laughs> you couldn't give a thumbs up. You couldn't be like, good job. You'd be like, good job. Couldn't do it. <laughs> but the Spirit gives us gifts to use in the body. It's just like the human body, just like I said. And last week, we learned when Pastor Jeremy spoke, he, uh, he spoke from verse 7 in 1 Corinthians 12. And it says, Now, to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. That means the body benefits as a whole from your gift. The problem is, here's the problem, and this is the problem in the Corinthian church, is that people are messy. Which means the church is going to be messy. The church in Corinth was messy. Again, this is why Paul writes this letter. From Paul's letter, we can tell that people were using their gifts for other things rather than common good. They, instead, they were using them, getting caught up in their own gift, and they were developing a pridefulness about it to the exclusion of others. That's not good. And then some were getting caught up in not having the same gift that somebody else had that maybe they wanted. 
and they were becoming envious or jealous or depressed about it. And it was causing dysfunction in the body of Christ. It's almost like parts of the body were falling asleep. And it ended up not working effectively. And it sounds like it was probably harming others. Their diversity was actually causing disunity. And therefore, this church was a mess. The second part, how do we, how do we uh, be a healthy, functional body of Christ? So the first one is understand that you are part of the body. If you're a follower of Christ, you're part of the body. The second one is understand that we all have an obligation as part of the body. And Paul addresses this on two fronts in regards to a healthy, functional body of Christ. There's an inward obligation and there's an outward obligation. And we're going to start with the inward obligation. I believe this comes from verses 15 through 20. Follow along with me, if you will. It says, Now if the foot should say, Because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being part of the body. And if the ear should say, Because I'm not an eye, I don't belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has placed the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were not all one part, where would the body be? Or if they, if they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, but one body. So our inward obligation actually comes from what Paul says in verse 18. God placed all the parts in the body how he wanted them. In other words, we have an inward obligation to accept God's desire and God's design for our lives as individuals. The God of the universe who provides for our salvation, provides for our forgiveness. He provides for, for our righteousness, our adoption as sons and daughters. He provides for our eternal reward. And he gifted you in a way that brings glory and honor to himself and it benefits and encourages the rest of the body around you. Now you can see in verses 15 and 16 that it sounds like some were, were not content with their gifting. They, they were comparing themselves to others and they were getting discouraged about it and they couldn't do what others were doing. They felt like their gifts weren't good enough. Here's what I have to say to that. Stop comparing yourself. Stop comparing yourself. This is a hard thing. I think we all fall uh, prey to this at times. But we have to stop comparing and here's why. I think that comparison is a ploy of the enemy. I think it's a subtle ploy of the enemy to breed acts of the flesh in each of our lives. You know, in Galatians 5, when it talks about the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. Do you know the section right before that is the acts of the flesh? And I love that Paul puts them right together because it's a stark contrast. The enemy wants to breed the things of the flesh in us. And so when we, when we start to, to compare ourselves to others, you know what comes to the surface? Jealousy, envy, selfish ambition. Guys, remember that the enemy wants us to operate by acts of the flesh. He wants dysfunction in the body of Christ. He does not want God to be honored and glorified. Therefore, we have to be on our toes about this. We have to stop comparing. Here's the thing. If we can trust God to save us, to forgive us, to make us clean, to call us his children, and we draw the line at where he gives us gifts, does that make sense? Does that make any sense at all? It's a little dysfunctional in my opinion. Either we don't really trust him at all or we're tolerating acts of the flesh in our lives. Rather than letting the spirit cultivate fruit in our lives, we're tolerating acts of the flesh. And therefore, we're failing to accept God's desire and God's design for our lives as individuals as part of the body of Christ. Now, the second part, outward, our outward obligation comes from verses 21 through 26. Follow along with me as I read that. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And the parts that we think are less honorable, we treat with special honor. And the parts that are unpresentable are treated with special modesty. While our presentable parts need no special treatment. But God has put the body get together, giving greater honor to the parts that lacked it, so that there should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. Church, our outward obligation, again, I think Paul addresses it in verse 25. There should be no division in the body, but that the parts would have equal concern for each other. 
In other words, we have an outward obligation to accept God's desire and design as the body of Christ. We have an obligation for God's desire and design as individuals and as the body of Christ. Again, you can see the attitude even in this section of Scripture. There's an attitude of comparison, but it's kind of from the other side this time. It's, it's more saying, it's not saying uh, I'm not needed or wanted. It's actually saying you're not needed or wanted. So in the Corinthian church, they were treating others like their gifts weren't as good or as needed. And again, it's not hard to see that there was dysfunction going on in this, in this church, in this body. And you better believe that there was some hurt going on. You know that if there's this kind of dysfunction going on, that there, there are people who are being hurt. There are people who are being offended. Paul goes on to say that those parts that seem weaker are actually indispensable. The ones that seem less honorable are actually honored more. And again, going back a few, a few verses, if God has placed all the parts in the body the way that he wanted, who in the world are the other parts to say who is needed and who's not? It's not their say. It's not up to them because they didn't place them there. No body part is independent from the rest of the body. And if it is, it's been amputated. Think about your body. If you're missing a body part, chances are it's probably been amputated. In verse 26, Paul's basically saying that no body part is independent from the rest of the body. He says, if one part suffers, every part suffers. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. So, this is a, this is a big point. There is interdependence, not independence, in the body of Christ. Listen to it again. There's interdependence. That means we all depend on each other, not independence. Independence screams division. It screams a lack of equal concern, and it bears the marks of the acts of the flesh. Listen to this. Some, some more of the acts of the flesh are discord, hatred, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions. What does independence do? In a group like this, what does it, are, if we are seeking our own indep independence, do you think those things are present there? They absolutely are. They absolutely are. And Paul goes, what Paul says in verse 25 goes completely against this. He says there should be no division and equal concern. In other words, interdependence, not independence. That is God's desire and design for the body of Christ. You guys know I love to use enduring word. I use it every time I preach, so it's no surprise that I have a, a quote here from them today. It says, the parts of the body work together. The eyes and ears do not only serve themselves, but the whole body. The hands do not only feed and defend themselves, but the whole body. The heart does not only supply blood to itself, but it serves the whole body. Sometimes there is a part of the body that only lives to serve itself. It doesn't contribute anything to the rest of the body, and everything it gets it uses to feed and grow itself. We call this cancer. We all know what cancer does to the body. It goes way beyond dysfunction. It actually destroys it. That's a pretty, pretty compelling picture there, church. So listen, our outward obligation is interdependence, not independence. By the way, I thought this was kind of interesting to throw in here. Um, I decided to look up what some of the, the top couple of useless body parts were. And you probably, you probably know this. The first one is the appendix. The second one is close. No, not really. <laughs> Wisdom teeth. Because. Wisdom teeth. But listen to this. This is, this is super fascinating. And, and I got this information from LiveScience.com in the Journal of Theoretical Biology. I got to look at that close because I don't even have any idea what any of that means. I know the word of and maybe journal in that sentence, but that's so far over my head. I'll let them tell you. This is what it says. In 2007, a group of researchers found the appendix may serve as a reservoir of useful gut bacteria the kind that helped the body digest food, they reported in the Journal of the Theoretical Biology. When, the disease, uh, when dise diseases flush both good and bad microbes from the gut, good bacteria can emerge from the safe harbor of the appendix to help restore the gut to a healthy state. I don't know about you, but if somebody's telling you to get your appendix removed, you might want a second opinion. Sounds like it's pretty useful to me. And then the second one is wisdom teeth. Humans' third molars, better known as wisdom teeth, can be used to chew food but are often considered unnecessary. 
In about 22% of people worldwide, at least one out of four wisdom teeth fails to grow in. When they do grow, the teeth are most likely to become impacted, meaning they don't properly emerge through the gums. That's because human jaws are too small to accommodate the teeth. Some scientists have chalked this up to humans developing smaller jaws over time. But now there's evidence to suggest that our childhood diets are more to blame. Consuming hard-to-chew foods like raw vegetables, nuts, and other foods stimulate jaw growth, while eating soft, processed foods somewhat stunt the jaw growth, leaving little room for wisdom teeth. Our ancestors' primitive diet consists of a lot of raw plants, hard nuts, and tough meats. And wisdom teeth were necessary to grind these foods for proper digestion. Today, modern food preparation and eating utensils have eliminated our need for wisdom teeth. We got used to these dietary changes. Our bodies went through small changes. For example, our jaws became smaller. This is why many people don't have enough room in their mouths for their wisdom teeth to grow in. And I talked to, uh, to Tracy Benjamin after church, and she's like, you're spot on. Because she's a dental hygienist, so she would know. So I'm glad to know that my research panned out here. And it's, it's, it's interesting that what we consider useless in the body is actually quite useless. They're quite useful. <laughs> quite useful. They're, they have a purpose. They have a reason. And so what's true in, in our human bodies is actually true in our spiritual bodies. So if, if, um, if God placed all the parts in the body, if he placed them all in the body the way that he wanted them to be, and his desire is no division and equal concern among all the parts of the body. In other words, this deep and meaningful interdependence, that means that each one plays a role for the body as a whole. Each one plays a role for the body as a whole. Paul says in verses 27 through 31, Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is part of it. And, get, uh, and God has placed in the church, first of all, apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, of helping, of guidance, different kinds of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all have the gifts of healing? Do all speak in tongues? Do all interpret? Now eagerly desire the greater gifts, and yet I will show you the most excellent way. So when Paul lists several of these examples, you know, he, he's listing several examples of the Spirit. It's not, it's not an exhaustive list. There are more gifts mentioned throughout Scripture, and even some that aren't mentioned in Scripture, that, that benefit the body as a whole. But what's cool is that many of these gifts are present right now. Look around the room. Many of these gifts are right here, right now in our church family. And, and we don't all have the same gifts. But can you imagine if we all used our gifts in a way that benefited the body of Christ? Can you imagine what that would be like? That would be awesome. Imagine that these gifts, you know, being used, how it would impact our church. And then imagine how our church would impact the community around us. I want you to think about this. I'm going to mention a couple of these gifts here. First, apostleship. Think missional boldness with this one. The word apostle simply means sent one. And in the New Testament, an apostle was a person, person commissioned by Jesus. He was sent out to raise up church leaders. And while the, the office of apostle is no longer uh, something that we, we use today, there's, there's still a, the gift of apostleship. And what this means is it, it's people who have the gift, usually it's people with the gift of like... Um, being a catalyst for kingdom initiatives, kingdom work, like missions work, local missions startups, church plants, not-for-profits, church multiplication. Think about this. Without this gift in the body of Christ, the church can't complete the first half of the mission that we are given by Jesus directly. We find that mission in Matthew, 19, uh, Matthew 28, 19 through 20. This is what Jesus said before he ascended into heaven. He says, Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. If we do not have the gift of apostleship in the church, who's going and making disciples? Nobody. You think this gift is pretty important? Because this mission is pretty important? Because the one that gave us the mission is pretty important? This matters. This gift matters. How about the gift of teaching? This means correctly explaining and applying the Bible. 
This, this gift isn't just used on Sunday mornings, guys. Many of you will never give a sermon on stage, but you can and you do use this gift, exercise this gift on a consistent basis. You do it in your workplace. You do it in small groups. You do it in kids' zone. You do it in roots. You do it over a cup of coffee with a friend. You think this gift matters? This gift pours into others as they develop in their relationship with Jesus. And again, this is an incredible, incredibly important part of the Great Commission. Again, Matthew 28, go and make disciples. And what's the second half? It says, in teaching them to obey everything I've commanded. Maybe we have people going out. We have the sent ones. But who's teaching them? Nobody. We, we're going to miss out on the whole second half. And I would argue, if we miss either half of this, this mission, we're missing the whole thing. Yep. You think it's important, church? You better believe it is. I don't know about you, but I don't want to try to complete just half of the mission. Then this last gift that I want to mention is helps. <laughs> I'm going to try to get through this. I've teared up a couple times in sharing this first service and, and even with Mandy the other day. But I love what Charles Spurgeon says about this. He says, it strikes me that they were not persons who had any official standing, but that they were only moved by the natural impulse of, and the divine life within them to do anything and everything which would assist either teacher, pastor, or deacon in their work of the Lord. They are the sort of brethren who are useful anywhere, who can always stop a gap, who are only too glad when they find that they can uh, make themselves serviceable to the church of God in any capacity whatsoever. Without this gift, the church couldn't fulfill its outward obligation of equal concern for others. And at that point, we probably wouldn't complete any part of the mission. If we didn't have any concern for others, we wouldn't complete any part of the mission. And I actually have a really, a really good story to illustrate this. This is the part that I struggle to get through. Probably, it's got to be seven years ago now before we launched this, this campus here in Shingle House. We were renovating the building and we had a church plant, you know, from several of the other campuses who came and they become part of, the, of, of this campus of, of Crosstown Shingle House. And uh, I remember we were getting close to launch and uh, we had a big meeting because we had to figure out who was going to serve where. We had to fill some of these roles. You know, if, we're, if the Spirit's given us gifts and we've got to minister to our community and minister to the people coming in here, every part of the body's got to be in place. And so part of that meeting was to, to figure this out. But before that meeting started, I got to tell you, personally, I, I was really, really struggling because I've never pastored before. You know, I, <laughs> I didn't grow up pastoring. I didn't ever plan to pastor. And so at that meeting, I just remember thinking like, God, what if this fails? What if I fail? What if I, I don't inspire people? What if, what if I can't this? What if I can't do that? I, I'll tell you what, it was a scary thing. And then during that meeting, hands were kind of going up around the room and people were saying, uh, I, I'll help with hospitality. That's what I did at this campus. I'll help with kids zone. That's what I did at this campus. And four or five people raised their hands and said stuff. And then I'll never, ever, ever forget this. <laughs> I remember Sharon raised her hand and said, I'll do whatever it takes. I'll do whatever it takes. And I was convicted right there. Like I felt like God was saying, it's not about you, man. It's not about you. Every other hand in the room went up and was just like, yeah, we'll do what she's doing. Man, I'm telling you that to this day, as you can tell, it's, it's still pretty impactful. That meant a lot to me as a guy who'd never pastored before. That meant a lot to me as a guy who never, he didn't have a clue what he was, what he was doing pastoring. But to see the body respond like that, like, I'm still crying about it seven years later, so it must have meant something. You said anything, Sharon. <laughs> Actually, I think, I think Wendell was like, yeah, you don't want her to clean. <laughs> to be fair. Oh, I'll never forget that, though. To me, that is a great example of the gift of helps and how it impacted the whole body. When every hand started going up around the room, and it, and it just was a domino effect. And I will never forget that story. I'll never forget it. 
Now I realize, guys, that maybe some of you don't know what your gift is. Maybe this is a new thing to you. I want to encourage you with the first action step to discover your gift. I, don't, I, I think it's, it's kind of an easy thing. I think God wants us to discover our, our gifts. The Holy Spirit wants us to unwrap our gift and use it. And so the first part of discovering your gift is pray that God will show you what it is. It's a super simple prayer. If you're praying along with the heart of God who wants you to have a gift and wants you to open it and use it, that prayer can be as simple as, Lord, I know you've given me a gift. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would reveal to me what it is and show me how I can use it for your honor and glory and to have a positive and healthy functional impact on those around me. Super simple. God wants you to open that gift. The second thing I would say is ask others to be honest with you. Ask others what they see in you. Super simple. So it probably seems awkward at first, but go to a friend and say, what do you see in me? Where can I plug in? And then I'm going to say this one, because this isn't in my notes. I shared it with first service. Do that from the other side. Maybe you see potential in somebody in, in, in the church that just needs a word of encouragement. And you can just say, you know, I see this in you. And I think it would really bless our church family. I think it would really bless the body of Christ if you would fulfill this. Because, man, you, you have this gift. I think sometimes people need to be encouraged that way. Some of you know what your gift is, but maybe you're not sure exactly how to use it. I want to encourage you to use your gift. <laughs> and I know every week we give this spiel with the connection card about if you want to serve. And it comes across sometimes like it's this, this disconnected thing. Hey, if you want to help us out, we need your help. Can you plug into this? We're, we're lacking people. And I hate, church, I hate that it comes across that way. Sometimes I don't know exactly what to say, so it comes across more with more of a heart of why we do this. And I feel like this sermon lends itself to speak into that. You are part of the body. You have something to offer the church as a whole, and the church as a whole has something to benefit from you. We can't be healthy, functional if parts of the body are falling asleep. Serving each other is what Jesus did. This is why, we, this is why church is here. We're, we're all one body. We're all one body. You have something to offer. The church has something to benefit from. And then here's an action point for all of us. And I think this is something that Paul kind of weaves through this whole passage this morning and not just through this whole passage. Like, I think this is a, in every church he writes to, this is a main point. This is, this is incredibly important. Pursue unity. He actually says that several times to other churches. And if it was important enough for him to say it back then to the churches back then, you better believe it's important enough for us this morning. It's important for every church, the church body as a whole, the big C church, in the whole world, pursuing unity. That's not a de default. I don't know about you. Unity isn't a default setting. You can't just sit back and unity happens. You have to pursue it, which is why Paul says it. We have to pursue unity. He says, no division, but equal concern. It means we need, we're diverse. Our diversity is built in. I can look around the room here and see that there's diversity. I can see a whole bunch of gifts across this room that I don't have. I thought about bringing up administration. That one, I feel like God was like, I'm going to give Tim some of this and some of the administration. Nah, let's see how that goes for him. I have zero administration ability. That doesn't mean I'm not willing to learn or to say I'll, I'll be used wherever I'm needed. But zero administration. But we're diverse in our gifts. We have to pursue the unified part because this is God's desire and design. Any other option, and it doesn't line up with God's character, it doesn't line up with his design, it doesn't line up with his desire. Think about this for just a second. If there is unity and no diversity, this is an example of Nazi Germany. And what was the result of that? The Holocaust. Millions and millions and millions of people hurt. How about no unity and no diversity? This is a little bit of a weird one. I actually had to poll some people to see if it was too weird. But the only thing I could come up with is, is like a dystopian robot uh, society. Like what I imagine, this is what I imagine, if AI took over. You know how there's like this fear that if AI takes over, it, it can like um, develop its own thoughts and start making its own decision? Well, imagine if there's a whole bunch of AI that just starts doing that. There, there, there's no diversity, but there's no unity either. 
That would be a that would be a disaster. They should make a movie about that. That's a great plot for a movie. <laughs> Maybe it's not. Maybe it's not. How about no unity but lots of diversity? I would tell you that I think that's generally the current state of our country. I would tell you that's generally the state that the Corinthian church was in, which is why Paul was writing about it. And it's chaos. It's straight up chaos. No, no unity, but plenty of diversity. And then where there is unity and diversity, I truly believe that this is God's desire and his design. Guys, we don't see this much in our culture. We don't see this in the world. And when we do see it, if we ever see it, it's usually for a cause that pales in comparison to what we're supposed to do as a church. It pales in comparison to the mission that Christ gave us. The church should be without question a leading example of unity and diversity. We are part of one body. Church, we are one body. And in order to be a healthy, functional body, every part has to play its role. Now, I don't know about you, but I can kind of speak from experience, from personal experience, that it's not good when a part of my body falls asleep, causes dysfunction, causes harm. God's desire and design is for a healthy, functional body of Christ. Amen? Amen. Amen. Well, I want to invite the worship teams up. And let me pray for us. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the direction and instruction. Lord, I just, I pray this morning. Um, thank you for the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Forgive us for not understanding or, or even digging into the power of the Holy Spirit, the ministry of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And Father, I pray that you give us wisdom. Give us understanding into how he ministers to us. God, I pray that you would pour the Holy Spirit out on us, that we would learn our gifts and that we would use our gifts and be functional and, and, and bring honor and glory to you. Help us to play a part as, as the body as a whole. Lord. We want to be a healthy, functioning body. And Father, we recognize that the enemy doesn't want any part of that. And he will do anything to disrupt us and discourage us. But Father, help us as we discover our gifts. Help us to use them. And I pray that you'd help us to pursue unity. Jesus, thank you for your, your sacrifice, for your love for us, and for sending the seal of the Holy Spirit. I pray that he would continue his ministry among us. Bless our time together now. In Jesus' name, amen.